Buonasera a tutti. Welcome everybody. Um, this is the last uh, conversation of our series about uh, Italian outstanding women in the U.S. And so at the beginning I want to thank Maria Teresa Cometto to invent and to uh, organize w with us this series. It's the second series we, we uh, do together. The first one last year was about Italian manager in the, in the American company. Uh, one of the protagonists of, the, of this series is here tonight. And, um, and this year, uh, a series about the uh, Italian women in the US. Um, this last conversation is with Monica Mandelli. Monica Mandelli studied at, Milan, at Milan's Università Bocconi and earned an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School. Uh, she started her career working first at Mary Lynch in London in their mergers and acquisition group and then at McKinsey and Company in New York. She afterwards joined Goldman Sachs where she stayed 17 years, a very long period in the finance world. And in uh, 2015, Mandeli joined KKR as a member of the uh, capital markets team where she works across capital markets and the client and partner group to focus on how to provide flexible capital solution and strategic advice to leading families around the world. Commenting on, uh, commenting on her professional life, she uh, has said, I've always thought women were undervalued I knew it was important for a woman, if she had the desire and capability, to try to have a big career. And I think that she had <laughs> and has a big career. So please welcome Monica Mandelli and Maria Teresa Cometti. Thank you, Director Giorgio Van Straten. Uh, it has been a great honor and uh, a great pleasure working with you, so thank you for trusting me. Uh, we have had a lot of fun, and uh, I know I will uh, miss very soon <laughs> this uh, series, but uh, who knows uh, next year what we are going to do. Uh, so I'd like to start with a very brief two minutes uh, uh, trailer of the movie Equity. Uh, can we lower the lights? What's that thing that really makes you want to get up in the morning? For me, I guess the simplest answer is I like money. I work for the largest investment bank in the world. I have taken nine companies public. I am so glad that it's finally acceptable for women to talk about success. Are you still locking up drug dealers? I'm actually in white collar crime. You got a file on us? We have a file on everyone. I guess you've heard the talk. They'll be naming a new global head. I'm going to be frank with you. The perception is that you rub people the wrong way. Hmm. Remind me why I didn't marry you. Yeah, well, men like a girl they can take care of. I'm gonna take your company public. Are you ready to be the rock star? Oh, yeah. Big smiles, we're gonna make a lot of money. Well, well done. done. This thing is getting hot. You guys went in on this now. We just raised $250 million. When Ed hits on you, you have to handle him professionally and very gently. Yeah. I know how this works. You give you anything on the hedge fund guy? She's not gonna give us anything. Now don't go doing anything rash. You're not in narcotics anymore. Somebody leaked a rumor about my IPO. They couldn't do anything. Yes, you did. Because you needed it. You don't know what I need. You have nothing on me, do you? Is that a challenge? You've been investigating him? I can't really comment on that. Did you leak this thing? You weren't a wire. It's all just a big game to you, isn't it? What else is that? Is there a problem? This doesn't look like your year. Secure? Yeah. Powerful? Absolutely. Don't let money be a dirty word. Please go start. see this movie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw it. It's really, really exciting. Very well done. Uh, so, 
quote, money is not a dirty word for women, unquote. So says Naomi, the lead uh, woman of the movie. Uh, what does that mean for you, uh, Monica? And uh, is it uh, uh, the reason you funded the movie uh, together with other women uh, who work uh, in finance? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me tonight, and thank you all for being here. Um, so here's what I, I would say. You know, it's interesting because women have made so many strides over the course of the last century, but I think money is still a very sensitive topic. Actually, there was an article on the New York Times two months ago that was titled, uh, Money is Power and Women Need More of Both. And I strongly recommend you read it because it basically said that even today, even in modern families where the parents are trying to educate kids exactly the same way, irrespective of gender, there's still a big difference in the way, um, maybe even unwillingly or subconsciously, people talk about money to little boys versus little girls. So for a boy, you want to instruct them that it's great to sort of be happy and be successful, but also make money and be a provider. For a woman, it's more about being happy or being successful, but not making money. I think money is considered something a little bit crass still in a lot of culture for women and something that we don't really talk about too much. So I actually think it's extremely important for women to recognize that making money is a good thing, not because <laughs> you necessarily want to buy a lot of things or you want to be particularly materialistic, but because money is power. And more importantly to me, money is freedom. Money is the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and support causes that you believe in. Frankly, this movie we thought was a story that had to be told and a bunch of us, maybe 20 women on Wall Street, that had, frankly, the money to finance the movie, financed the movie and produced this film that was produced, directed, acted, uh, inter and everything sort of scripted by women. So and so it's important. Yeah, so uh, you had an experience working uh, uh, in Hollywood. Yes. What, what uh, do uh, Hollywood and uh, Wall Street have in common? Well, I think, look, I, I don't know Hollywood as well as I know uh, Wall Street, of course. And by the way, I've only invested in this film, although I should tell you that I'm investing in a new movie now, <laughs> which is actually we're filming right now uh, outside Philadelphia. And it's another women, I only invest in women-based story. So this is another story written by women, directed by women. And uh, it's about, um, it's a World War II thriller, uh, titled still TBD. Uh, that actually tells the story of this woman called Vera Atkins, who's a true character that basically helped Churchill uh, train some women to be spies in the German-occupied France because at the time the Germans wouldn't suspect of women as much as they would of men, and so they were sent in to sabotage um, the Germans, which it's a great story. So anyway, that's a, another thriller, but historic this time, so we're filming right now. Hopefully we'll get into Sundance next year. I think that um, the, both places are super high charged, uh, very intense, and with a lot of alpha personalities. And so I think there are some commonalities between Hollywood and Wall Street because there's a lot of money to go around. Uh, there's a lot of uh, alpha male there. And, uh, and clearly a lot of visibility and power to be conquered and maybe not shared. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence that in these kinds of high-charged environments, men still have the most powerful jobs. Yeah, uh, one thing that they have in common also is uh, um, the consequences of the Me Too movement. Uh, on the magazine uh, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, uh, this week uh, there is a story about uh, a class action started by a woman uh, uh, who worked uh, in, in my previous Goldman farm. Sachs, exactly, and uh, they claim she claims uh, uh, that there was a, 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 a climate of uh, uh, discrimination uh, against women. And, and also today on the Wall Street Journal, there, there is a the piece of news about uh, uh, women at Visa, the credit card the company, meeting the CEO to complain about uh, the way they are treated. Is, is it really so bad for women in the industry? Okay, I'm going to say something uh, positive for once to start, and then we can talk about the negatives. But I would say, compared to 20 years ago when I started, um, I think, and I know some of you here 
um, are on Wall Street too. So I would love your perspective. But I think things are better in the sense that some overt type commentary or some actions that were taken at the time now would be considered inadmissible. So commentary on how a woman looks or you know, innuendos and things of that sort are, would be illegal today. And so those don't exist anymore. Um, the problem that exists, though, is that what remains, unfortunately, is a more subtle, almost passive-aggressive, um, if you wish, non-overt, undercover discrimination that is, um, I think, still present, unfortunately. And maybe we can call it with a tamer word, which is bias. Maybe it's unconscious bias, subconscious bias. Maybe it's, it's more... Uh, in the culture and in the perceptions rather than you know the willingness of people to really discriminate but that said it's present and it's there and so there are stereotypes that, that remain for example, pretty true for example well I think there's a lot of stereotypes but the stereotype um, one stereotype could be that women are more emotional than men that's a classic stereotype that you hear over and over again uh, or that um, some men even think that women are less quantitative than men I mean Larry Summers said that, right? Uh, so because they are not good at math. Exactly, which absolutely is not true. Uh, there is a stereotype that women are maybe uh, less of a longer-term player because people are afraid that if they have a child or multiple children, eventually they may quit. Um, so there's a lot of stereotypes that are out there. I'm not saying every person feels that way, but there's some cultural conditioning that exists. and so. Firms like ours, for example, are doing mandatory training against bias so that we all learn to view people without that lens that maybe we haven't created ourselves but simply exists. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just not fair. Uh, talking about women and Wall Street again, uh, what do you think about the fearless girl, the statue that was put in front of uh, uh, the Wall Street bull and now it's, uh, it's been moved, moved to the stock in front of the stock exchange? Uh, the sculpture who made the, 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 the bull, uh, who is Italian, by the way, for whom... Uh, Modica, who, no? Yeah, Arturo Di Monica was very upset. He said it was not art uh, uh, because, in fact, it was commissioned by a financial firm, State Street. Correct. Um, to launch a fund that I think was women-based of some sort. Something like that, yes. yes. So what well, is your take about it? So, look, uh, I would say I don't want to comment on the artistic value of the fearless girl or uh, I don't want to be part of this sort of whether it's a marketing ploy by State Street or not. All I would say is that personally, if I may, I actually like the fearless girl simply because I like anything that is fearless. So the idea that there's a girl there that is fearless or a woman that is fearless or for that matter, it could be a man that's fearless is terrific. I mean, I personally like myself when I'm fearless. When I'm passionate about something and I just go for it and I want to win and I don't care about the consequences, then, then it's what I like myself the most, right? And all of us, I think, should be more fearless. So having a, a memory or memento of that in front of the stock exchange, I think, is outstanding. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and, and it's also a very big attraction uh, uh, for tourists, uh, the number of tourists visiting uh, the bull and Even the better. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the girl you were when you grew up in Monza. Uh, Monica was uh, born in Monza, uh, which is a town close to Milan. And uh, uh, once you told me that uh, you were eight years old uh, when something happened that uh, yes. changed your life. Can you Yes, tell us uh, you know, I think it? that, and by the way, can you hear me guys? Yeah. Um, I think there are uh, pivotal moments, right, in all our lives that define who we are. And sometimes they're really small, but they have a meaning and you remember them, right? And so that day, I remember I was with my mother and we went visiting a girlfriend of hers and the girlfriend was commenting, I remember to this day, that she really wanted to buy this pair of shoes. And she said, I need to ask my husband for the permission and the money to buy the shoes. And, uh, you know, realize that I grew up in a very traditional family where, you know, all the men worked and the women didn't go to college and you know, learned instead how to go to finishing school and be good housekeepers and managers of the house and manager of the family. And, uh, and so I lived in that environment. And in that particular moment, when the friend of my mom said, I'm gonna ask for the money and the permission to buy a pair of shoes, I said to myself, wait a second, this is really not gonna work for me. Um, 
I will never ever have anybody give me the permission or the money to buy a pair of shoes or for that matter to buy anything and I think that did change my life I mean independence is a strong trait of my character in case it wasn't clear but uh, but, but, um, but definitely um, that episode was a bit landmark for me and uh, when did you decide to uh, start this career? I decided more or less by accident, to be honest, because, um, so I always wanted to leave the country because I figured that Italy was a wonderful country, but if you weren't um, the daughter of somebody important or whatnot, it was frankly a little bit hard to have a successful career, at least when I was growing up. And so I knew I wanted to go away, and so I remember that I asked my friends what it is that I should do to guarantee that I would get a job abroad, and everybody said, oh, you need to go to this University Bocconi, because it's the only place where all the international firm come and recruit, so after that you for sure will get a job abroad. And so I said, fine, what do they study at this university? And I said, oh, uh, there's only two majors, business and economics, and I'm like, okay, business seems too practical, this economics seems a little bit more of a theory, so let's go for that. And I said, what is exactly economics? I mean, I'm like 17 years old. And they're like, and somebody said to me, oh, it's great. It's the science that studies the allocation of scarce resources. <laughs> and I was like, really helpful. <laughs> I don't have no idea what you just said, but sure. Allocation of scarce resources? Okay, sounds good. So I applied and I got in purely with the idea of going abroad. And after I did, I, I went to this course called DES, which was a little bit more theoretical and a little bit longer program. Most people that went to my program, which was very much sort of macro and, and, and conceptual, not so much business focused or finance focused, most of them went for a PhD in the United States and then became professors. So I thought I'm gonna become an economics professor. I had an artistic side to myself. I like speaking in public, so uh, I could teach. That would be perfect, I'm gonna be a professor. And then, by chance, and I'm going to cut it short, I, a friend of mine called me that had graduated a year before me, and he was an analyst at Merrill Lynch in London in M&A. And he said, Monica, you must do this job. And I said, what do you mean? I'm going to do my PhD when I graduate. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You are perfect for this mergers and acquisition. And I said, why? Well, because you're good with math, and you're very good with people, and you work extremely hard. Oh, and you speak English really well. And I was like, okay, that's it. <laughs> he goes like, yeah, that's it. And so he said, the people, um, sorry, otherwise I need to keep bending because I'm too tall. Um, so the people from Merrill Lynch are coming to interview. And I said, but I know nothing about finance. And he says, no problem. Go to the library and borrow this book called Principles of Corporate Finance, <laughs> which I never had studied in my life. And he says, and you know, and study chapter 12 on mergers and acquisitions and then go to the interview. <laughs> And so I went to the interview, and I was very honest. I said, look, I study macroeconomics, statistics, you know, econometrics. I know nothing about finance, but I read the chapter on <laughs> corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions. If you want, I can regurgitate what I studied. <laughs> but I'm very smart, I said, and I work and really they hired, hard. They hired me. Excellent. Uh, so you graduated uh, from Bocconi, which is one of the best uh, business school uh, in Europe and uh, in the world now. Uh, up, it's uh, gone up a lot, rankings, yeah. yeah. And then you had uh, um, your MBA at uh, Harvard. Um, how do you compare the education you got in Italy to the new environment that you found uh, at Harvard? You know, I want to say just one thing. I think that every good school in whatever country has some affinity and similarities, and the similarities are obvious ones. So the quality of the people is very high. The intellectual focus is very high. The desire to create content and interesting topics and develop them is there. So I'd say the passion for learning is the same. Uh, I think the big difference is that uh, I think the US is much more practical. Even if the subject that you're studying is identical, the way you study it is very different. I think the culture in Europe is, and not just Bocconi, but more broadly, is probably much more focused on learning a lot of notions and a lot of information and a lot of ideas. And it's much more academic. The, the, the bend and the slant at Harvard was much more practical. And so you, it didn't matter so much that you memorized facts or notions or information or data. It was much more about negotiating your point, uh, articulating your point in bullet points, 
uh, discussing it and debating it in a case study format. All those skills that are much more useful, I think, when you are in a real job environment. So I think it's much more real life skills, more than an academic bent. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Lynch, what do you remember about entering the boys club? Uh, Okay, you're not going to believe it, but this was like 1994, and the first thing I was told when I came in was that women could not wear pants. So I could even wear a pantsuit because it wasn't feminine enough. That sounds ridiculous, right? So in 1994, which is not that long ago, I mean, I feel so old now, um, I had to wear a skirt every day because it was not allowed to do otherwise for a woman. So that's how bad it was. Uh, and of course, at every meeting, I was the only woman. And of course, um, I told you the story that when I used to go on a plane, I was the only female in business class most of the times because it was all businessmen. And, uh, and everybody thought I was the stewardess and they asked me to hang their coat. Or when I would go to a meeting, no, they would say, signorina, signorina, mi appende il cappotto. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I mean, I'm gonna find out who hangs the coats here, but I'm sitting in 2A just next to you, but that's okay. And, and they would be shocked and flabbergasted. And then I would go to the meeting, to the board meeting, and it's all like men over 50, and me and my managing director, and everybody was like, Signorina, they think I'm the secretary, do you wanna, which by the way, it's totally great to be a secretary, but it just so happened that I had done the valuation of the company. And so they're like, Signorina, can you get me coffee, espresso, macchiato, whatever? And I'm like, sure, now I'm gonna go figure out where the coffees are, but then when you're ready, I can start the presentation, and they're looking at me like I'm this monster with like green eyes or something. <laughs> And, uh, and so I thought it was very different and it was just, you know, 20 some years ago. So I think we've made tremendous progress because nowadays I was actually counting the other day, I was coming back in first class from Los Angeles and half of the first class was women and it, they were traveling alone and they probably were business women. And I was like, wow, yay, all of this has happened in 24 years, that's amazing. And so I think it's terrific that we've made so much progress. I unfortunately think we're nowhere where we need to be. Sheryl Sandberg, the Chief uh, Operating Officer of uh, Facebook, uh, wrote the book uh, Lean In yeah. and also started a movement uh, uh, saying that women must be more assertive. Do you think that uh, uh, the lack of assertiveness is uh, the main problem for women or what else? Okay, I have so many comments on this point. First of all, I love Cheryl. I actually invited her at Goldman when I was running the Women's Network there to come and talk when she wrote the book Lean In, and she's terrific. And I think it's great what she's trying to do. And for sure, in general, women need to lean in more and be more vocal. I'm not gonna say it's not true. But I think there's some caveats I wanna make to that. One is this fact that women don't speak up is also a little bit of a stereotype, I think. Uh, and I think that the, pr the real problem is that it's twofold. One is, the field in which we play is too narrow, is narrow compared to one of the guys, sorry guys in the room. And the reason you'll understand is because women need to be super careful at what they do all the time. So if I am not vocal enough, then I'm timid, I'm not um, commanding the meeting, so there's a problem, right? So I need to lean in. But if I'm vocal and aggressive, then I'm like Naomi, I'm too much, I'm too much, I'm the B word. Right? So you, you have such a narrow corridor where you can walk, where you can't be too aggressive or else you're a B. Or, uh, or if you're not aggressive enough, you're not vocal, you're you know, somewhere standing in the background and you're never gonna be a leader. And so it's extremely difficult to navigate. While for a man, uh, excuse me, there's like leaders of all kinds. There's the more quiet leader who doesn't speak much in the meeting but is super smart and when he speaks everybody listens. Or there's a leader that talks a lot and is super aggressive but it's okay because he's a guy. And so there's a lot of kinds of men that succeed and we see them. There's not a lot of women that succeed and the, the range of women that succeed behaves very similarly according to a pattern that has been created for us. And so what I think is that we really need to change the rules of the game. Unfortunately, the only way out of this is that we create a critical mass of women at the top that hire other women, that behave normally as themselves, like bring your whole self to work without worrying too much if I'm too aggressive or too little, I'm just me. And when there's a critical mass of us behaving just like us, it's gonna be okay. But the problem is how do we create that critical mass? And so it's uh, almost like a call for every woman, please stay in your job, please continue to work, please continue to strive to be better because if we don't create that mass, it's gonna be extremely hard. Yeah. Uh, what about the networking among women? I know that you started uh, uh, 
I think it's important more than ever, frankly, especially in a time when men are more afraid than ever to give feedback because of the Me Too. So I think, so uh, one point I would make is that the Me Too movement is amazing and I'm super supportive of it. It has had some unintended consequences, which include the fact that men are more afraid to do things with women so you, and you, to communicate with women. You have seen that. For sure. And I think that um, men in general, for example, would be more afraid to give feedback to women in fear that that feedback may be misinterpreted. Now, that's a problem because feedback is a critical tool for development. You want to have the feedback so you can do better. And so that's one problem. The other problem is, frankly, that because of this Me Too movement, I think it would be very hard for a senior man to take out a young woman for dinner, for mentoring because he would be afraid it's misperceived, or going for drinks at night. I mean, anything that happens after darkness probably is eliminated, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I would say, no, I mean, he's laughing, but I think it's true, right? Why would you put yourself in that position? And so you can have lunch with your boss and get the mentoring, but what I'm trying to say is that every time we are in these situations, we create less opportunity for women to get the mentoring they need, to get the criticism sometimes or the support or the uh, feedback they need and so more than ever I think now uh, women should help other women to get that critical feedback to get the support so for example even in the last week if I can give you two brief examples I had a woman come to me young woman at my firm saying you know I don't know how to handle this because she's an associate I'm working with a principal who's a stellar performer guy right He's a stellar performer, great investor, so everybody loves him. But, you know, I think he is very condescending with women. And when he talks to me or works with me, I really feel that something's very wrong. I don't like working with him. I think he treats me not as nicely. But he never says anything or does anything that crosses the line. So it's very impalpable. It goes back to that non-overt discrimination that she feels, she senses, she tells me about it, but she doesn't know how to better articulate it, so what is she gonna do? Who is she gonna talk about this with? She can't go to HR and complain because there's really nothing to complain. Plus, he's a stellar performer. He's not even a bad guy, so what are we gonna say? Um, so I think having more women to talk to in these circumstances is actually very important. If nothing else, because I can say, look, it has happened to me too. Uh, don't take it personally. Try to get staffed with somebody else. I mean, there's so many strategies that you can take, but somebody needs to tell you. Or another woman comes to me and says, I'm pregnant. She's a vice president, and she says, I don't know when I'm going to tell my boss, and also, how do I tell my boss that I'm still committed because my husband is a surgeon? And I said, okay, what does that have to do And with the, with the whole situation? Oh, because, you know, I am not the sole breadwinner. So I think actually there's a whole group of women that feel that it's better to be the sole breadwinner because if you are the sole breadwinner in your family, or you are considered more like a guy. And therefore, you're a longer term player because you're not going to go anywhere, you're going to stay in the job. If instead you have a spouse or a partner who's successful, then do you really need to come back after the kids or are you just going to stay home? Do you really want to be full on after you have the kids or you want a more part-time scenario? Which, by the way, is okay, but then you're not the person I'm going to give the special assignment to or yeah. the great thing to do. Uh, in fact, in the movie, um, the young investment banker, Erin, uh, is pregnant and because she wants to be promoted, she conceals the pregnancy. Uh, so how, how did you made it, make it? Uh, you have three children. Yeah, right. So I concealed as long as I could, and then I couldn't. And I think, so I think, um, I remember to this day that when I went to tell my boss that I was pregnant with my first kid, which was 12 years ago, this is not like a century ago, I was probably the only woman in my group that ever had this situation occur. So, I mean, that had a kid. So I had no precedent and no idea. So I went in and I said, look, I'm having a kid, but I just want to tell you in the same sentence that I'm extremely committed to my career, that I'm coming back, and that I'm full on. And I was terrified because I knew that the year later I was up for a managing director, so I was terrified that they would underpay me, steal my clients. I actually, I have to confess, ended up not taking the whole four months of maternity leave because I was afraid that people would take away my clients and I came back much faster. I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. I think now it's much better and I think people are much more supportive than they were even 12 years ago. But um, yeah, it's not perfect. 
I think there's still an element of anxiety. I think actually, for example, for my work now at KKR, people are super supportive and we have, it's now normal for women to have kids much more than it was even just 10 or 15 years ago. And so we have strategies to make sure that you leave, you have four months off, your clients are taken care of, you get them back when you come back. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been put in place that didn't exist even 10, 15 years ago. Does your husband help you with the children? He's in finance too. So, okay, I'm going to say one thing that is super important. Um, whoever you choose as a spouse, it has to be somebody incredibly supportive. I don't care what they do in practice, but they need to be supportive. So it's more important to me to know that my husband supports my career than knowing that he is actually going to pick up the kids or something like that. Because I knew from the beginning, and this I knew always, that I had rather have been alone than being with somebody that wasn't going to allow me to be what I wanted to be. And so the fact that my husband is supportive and he knows that when he comes home at night during the week, I'm not going to be there. I mean, if I'm there, it's great. But it's a coincidence because most of the most of the time I just won't be or that I never cook I never cook during the week I never cook maybe I cook on the weekend if I have time as a hobby but otherwise I don't cook or I don't do laundry I don't do laundry I just don't I've decided I don't I, I just don't and so there are certain things that I don't do that maybe stereotypically one would expect and so if you find a spouse that understands that he can ask, ask you to do whatever he doesn't do, um, that's terrific. And so I'm delighted to have a super supportive husband that doesn't expect me to do anything more than he does, which is very little. Um, <laughs> but, the part, but the part that's terrific is that, and what people don't under, understand or think about immediately is that the lucky part of being in a career in finance is that you actually make enough money that you can create a support system around you that allows you to have a big job, that allows your spouse to have a big job and allows you to have kids and still have quality time with your kids because you can afford to have some people that help you doing the things that you otherwise would have to do, like the chores and everything else. And so overall, you find an equilibrium that actually works really well. Mm -hmm. But you need to be super scheduled. Like my family is a military operation. It's as scheduled as my work day. And it sounds pretty sad, but like on Sunday, we have family meeting with even the kids, and we discuss the plan for the next week. And so I say, okay, mommy tonight is flying out. She's going to London. So tonight you're going to be with daddy, and then tomorrow you're going to be with daddy, and then uh, Tuesday daddy's going to Boston. So Tuesday night you're going to be with the nanny, but then Wednesday mommy comes back, and then Thursday my son is going on a field trip to Washington, D.C. And I mean, everything is part of the schedule. And the kids love it because they feel they're part okay. of the life of the family. In fact, they want to know the schedule even on the weekends. On Saturday morning, I come to my room and like, what's the schedule today? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh, do we have to have a schedule today? Yeah, little and, monster. and so what I do is because my husband is super scheduled and I'm not. Um, I mean, I am at work, but traditionally it wouldn't be if it, were, if it were up to me. So what I do is when my husband is not there and I'm with the kids, I do break every rule day which is great. So we say, because you need to be fun and break every rule. And so we have these break every rule Saturday where we can do breakfast for dinner, stay in a pajama all day, watch movies in the morning, do all these things that normally would be completely unacceptable according to my 12, eight and eight year old kid, kids, but, um, but they love it. Mm -hmm. Good. It looks like fun. Very much. Uh, so what do you teach uh, your children about money? Uh, my husband, uh, Glauco Maggi, who's book, very supportive right? of me, yeah. uh, we together uh, wrote this book, uh, um, Figli e Soldi, Kids and Money, um, and, uh, about the importance of financial education and, uh, uh, in our opinion, giving an, uh, the allowance to children uh, is a good tool to uh, help them manage a budget. Uh, what is your policy about it? A lot of thoughts. Um, I would say before even I start talking about money to my kids, and I remember my kids are 12, 8, and 8, um, I want to make sure that they are driven and hungry and focused. That's more important to me than teaching them about money. I want them to teach them that they need to work really hard and want things and want to win and fight for what they want. To me, that's even more important than teaching them about money. And so um, I try to 
talk to them about going to school as a job. And so even if they're little, like, okay, mo mommy goes to KKR this morning to work and you'll go to school and you're gonna just do your best every day. I don't care what grades you get, but you need to give your all every day. And so we, I, you know, it's funny because with children, you look at for imagery they will remember. And then I like that imagery even for adults. And so with my kids, we do the gladiator thing. And so we say, we're like gladiators. Because my son, my first son is very academic, but he's also insecure, so he's afraid he's not gonna do well. So I said, you know, when you go to school in the morning, don't be afraid. You need to be fearless, like the fearless girl. You're a gladiator. So you put on your armor, you go in one step at a time, one breath at a time, and you go through the day. So what are we? Gladiators. And then I also say that we have superpowers. We all have superpowers. And so I ask him, okay, guys, what's your superpower? And so everybody has a superpower. You all do have a superpower. So I encourage you to think, what's your superpower? And then use it to get where you want to go. And so I have all these stories with my kids because I want them to be super hungry, super aggressive, and super focused, and that works. In the money in particular, I'm going to say just one thing, that a lot of people tell you when you're a kid, at least they told me, you know, just do whatever makes you happy, right? Just follow your dreams. I don't say that to my kids. I say follow your dreams as long as your dreams generate an income that is sufficient for you to be happy. Which means, no, but, and by the way, it's true. Because to me, being rich is what is rich for you. What makes you happy? What makes you live the life you want to be? And it's not the same amount for everyone. And so, but I want them to be clear that if their passion is to be a nursery school teacher, that is amazing. They should go for it. But they need to realize how much money a nursery school teacher makes. And if that is an amount of money that is sufficient for them to be happy and do the things they want to do with their lives, that is fantastic. I'm super supportive. But if it's not, they should rethink it. They should. And so I think maybe I'm too realistic and too honest, but I think it's important for people to realize that they need to go for what they want when it's also something that gives you the, the monetary comfort that is important to you as a person, and that's different for everyone. Interesting. Uh, going back to women in business, uh, in Italy there are rules that uh, uh, mandate diversity in uh, uh, companies' boardroom, the so-called uh, quota rosa or pink quotas. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's a good idea? I have mixed feelings on that because on one hand I understand the argument that to create critical mass you need to impose a quota sometimes because if you need to go to z from 0 to 30 fast, that's probably the only way. On the other hand, uh, what I think is the unintended consequence of that is that sometimes I've seen selections, for example, board members, etc., where in order to put a woman, they maybe picked a woman that wasn't the most qualified person for the role. And if that happens, that is going to perpetuate the idea that, well, in order to create diversity, we have diluted the talent level. And that's not something we want. I want to be chosen for things because I'm really good at what I do. I want people to look at me, not because I'm a woman or I'm a man. And men should feel the same way. All of us should want to be chosen because we're great at what we do, irrespective of our gender. That's the objective. And so I'm not convinced that the quateros at the end of the day are serving us in the right way. Wall Street, uh, there are a lot of stereotypes about women, but also a lot of stereotypes about uh, Wall Street. A lot of movies uh, about bad guys, uh, Wall Street and uh, sure. greed is good, uh, the barbarians at uh, the gate uh, about uh, KKR. Uh, can you tell us, normal people, uh, what good can Wall Street do for Main Street? I think a few things. Um, you know, first I want to say an anecdote. Every time we have a firm meeting at KKR, we had one a couple of days ago, when we show our presentation on sort of how the firm is doing, et cetera, et cetera, to the executives, then at the end, the last slide is practically always a slide that says, remember who we're working for. And in the slides, there's the pictures of policemen, teachers, firefighters, construction workers. Because the reality is, in my case, like KKR is a firm that is an alternative asset manager, our biggest investors are pension funds. We have like something like 70 million pensioners in the United States that are exposed to our funds. And so we are responsible for helping make their pensions more viable and have their pension funds sort of perform better. And so that's a huge responsibility. That's how are we contributing. That's who we're working for. I mean, obviously, we're working for ourselves, too. But we're working for them. 
So that's kind of point number one. The second point is, I think a lot of these firms, like my firm, are actually, without the general population knowing, we're one of the biggest employers in the world because we own at any moment in time a portfolio of companies that is in the, you know, we have, or just in our private equity portfolio, we have 120 companies that are very large and we employ almost a million people. And so imagine the impact we can have if we institute good things in these companies. So if we have our mindset, which I think we do, of making money while doing good. And so for example, we have a very extensive ESG program where we are um, hiring veterans. Sorry, sorry, explain ESG. Oh, ESG is uh, environmental, social, and governmental initiatives. So these are initiatives sort of for the good of the environment, of society, etc. And so we have um, initiatives to hire veterans. So in the last few years, we have hired thousands of veterans in our, the companies we control. Or we have initiatives to reduce emissions in the companies we own. Or we have re initiatives, for example, I'm on the diversity committee at KKR. One initiative we have this year is to look at all our portfolio companies and the board composition to make sure there's more women and diversity in our boards without having the pink quotas. We're trying to do it ourselves. Or um, another great example is what we try to do and implement in our companies is to do an equity program for employees. So when we buy a company, maybe that is owned by one or two people, we try to instead give equity to all the employees so that when then we sell the company or take it public, the employees may have a significant amount of money that goes to them. That sometimes is life changing. I mean, I've seen videos of companies where we bought the company, we gave um, a stake to all the employees and then you would see people that are workers that when we did the IPO would make you know thousands of dollars enough to pay the tuition for their kids to go to college or enough to buy a new car enough to pay the mortgage for the house these are like life-changing things that we can do for the companies we buy and so I think there is a role for the private sector and the alternative investors to do good uh, by just the sheer power that we have by buying and investing in so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from the institutional investors, uh, uh, among your clients there are a lot of uh, wealthy families, uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, all around the world. Is there a difference in the attitude, uh, in their attitude uh, towards the risks? For example, um, uh, the Italian uh, wealthy families, is it true that they are more conservative uh, and they invest less uh, in new companies, in startups compared to, I don't know, the American Okay, so here's what I would say. My clients are all sort of extremely um, wealthy families that are more institutionalized than individuals, right? So when somebody has billions of dollars, has usually a family office, has people like us that manage the money uh, for them, and so they're more of an institution. But that said, I think you're absolutely right, and every family is different, every high net worth individual is different, but there's some generalization that can be made that are somewhat geographic, but they're more related to the age of the wealth. And so, for example, it is true that in Europe, there are a lot of families that have had money that it's built over generations, let's say starting with the Industrial Revolution, the big steel companies in Germany or in France or in the UK or even in Italy, the big industrial families that now are already at the fourth generation of wealth or the fifth generation of wealth. And so for those families, it's not that they're less risky because they're more risk averse, it's simply because when you have a family office that is trying to take care of, let's say, a hundred descendants because you're already at the fifth generation, what do those descendants want? They need to get cash coupons, like cash dividends or yield so they can live, right? They want to use the money to live and do whatever it is that they want to do with their lives. And so it's obvious that when you invest, you probably invest in more conservative investments where you have less downside and less risk of losing the capital and more cash uh, generative investments that give you a yield that you can give out to the descendants. If instead you're a first generation billionaire from Silicon Valley or hedge fund, um, you are probably more risk prone, partly because you have zero descendant or maybe a couple and it's still your own money that you created 15 or 20 years ago you have still the mentality of the entrepreneur so you're probably much more flexible and risk prone than somebody that has money for a hundred years or 200 years so I think it is not so much that people in Europe are more conservative and people in America or in Asia are more aggressive it's just that generally speaking the money is newer. And where the money is newer, like here or in Asia, people are generally more aggressive, by definition. I see. Uh, 
to us who don't have so much money, <laughs> which kind of, in, of advice can you give us uh, about investing, generally speaking, and also uh, about the current financial markets? So here's what I would say. First of all, I am not in the business of giving advice to individuals, so that's not what I do for a living, so I'm not going to give you any specific advice. But the thing that I would say is, you know, I was reflecting upon something like this. You know, I think it goes back to your point on financial literacy. And I think it goes back to what it is that we do every day, right? Think about the other things where you delegate to a professional. Let's say haircut. If you need to get a haircut, do you cut the hair yourself or you go to a hair? dresser. Probably you go to a hairdresser. That's not a, such a complicated task, but you recognize that you shouldn't do it yourself and you go to a hairdresser. Yet, when you go to the hairdresser, you have enough knowledge that you can ascertain whether the hairdresser is going to do a good job or a terrible job in dyeing your hair blonde or cutting it or whatever. And so that is the same for, why don't we do the same for financial services? Why is it that we think that we can do it ourselves without having the knowledge or the expertise. Maybe we should have people that advise us with our savings. So I would say one, use experts, like you do when you get a haircut. And two, <laughs> be knowledgeable and study up, because it is impressive how many people don't even know how to ascertain whether a financial advisor is capable or not. And if you don't, how do you know that he's suggesting or she's suggesting the right investments for you and for your um, you know, for your safety, your pension, whatever it is that you want to do, your retirement. And so I think everyone needs to go back to the importance of financial literacy. It is astonishing to me how very smart people, very capable people have no idea about money. And so I think it's not just so much just about women, it's about every one of us. I have girlfriends that went to Princeton and they don't know anything about a mortgage or they don't know how to set up you know, um, anything so that if they get divorced, they're gonna get the house. I mean, there's some basic things that you need to do to protect yourself. I mean, I'm kind of joking, but not so much. I think there are things that we all need to do to protect ourselves from a financial perspective that sometimes we don't do. And I think I encourage all of you to learn as much as you can about that because it's actually important to at function. Least, at least the basic. The basics, yes. Uh, yes, last question. Uh, Naomi, the leading investment banker in the movie, uh, she goes to the gym to do boxing, yes. to release tensions. What do you do to fight stress or to recharge your batteries? So I go to the country on the weekend in a place that's quite isolated in Connecticut and I sleep. So sleep is a good thing to catch up on the sleep that I don't get enough during the week. And the second thing I would say is spend time with my family and my kids in particular, because right now they're at an age where actually they're a huge source of energy for me. And uh, I take from them all the energy I can. And I think they do a really good job because I try to see life from their lenses and stay young and stay as you know aggressive and as focused. And I'm going like they do for the gold, exactly like I did when, I'm 20, when I was 20 years old. I'm as relentless, as focused, as charged as I was then. Maybe that's my superpower. Great, thank you, Monica. Questions from, okay, let's start from there. Um, do we have a mic? Or? Can you say your name and Hi. something about you? Yes, uh, Ivano Panetti, my background, private equity. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you like the most about your job? Oh my gosh, I like so much about my job, <laughs> so, but I'm going to try to be succinct. Um, what I love about my job is, number one, the people I work with because they're all extremely smart and they keep me on my toes every day. I, I just feel I need to give my best just because they give their best and I can't let anybody down. The second thing that I love about my job is my clients because I think my clients are outrageously interesting people, uh, super smart people and uh, I enjoy spending time with them, learning from them and trying to solve their problems. The third thing that I love is probably um, solving problems. It's almost like when you decide to invest or when you find a deal where you want your clients to invest alongside you or when you find ways for them to deploy capital or find ways to provide capital to them, 
it's, uh, it's finding intelligent solutions to a problem. And I find that challenging because it's intellectually interesting, but I also find it challenging because it's a situation where you can win or lose, and it's a possibility for winning, which I enjoy very much. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed your talk very much and your enthusiasm for uh, what you're doing. Um, my name is David Sutcliffe, and we publish on high-tech sports gear for golf, ski, and tennis. And my question is, recently the Wall Street Journal ran an article on pension funds lagging the market and the la rather large gap between what you can produce and what the companies need to pay their liabilities. So I wondered if you could say something about that. And I'll just add one other thing. Uh, when people are looking at investing, uh, people like Vanguard have done very well because of the very low fees. And I imagine your fees are a little bit higher than Vanguard's. And do you deliver the uh, differential to make it attractive over passive investments? Uh, so here, here I would like to say, uh, first of all, on the pension, very good point. I think that what I was saying before, is, and we were talking about it before this uh, session, you know, it's very interesting, like the Wall Street Journal reported that, you know, there's benchmarks and targets that the pension funds are trying to reach, and it's very hard for them to do. And what we've seen in recent years, and not just in the U.S., but frankly around the world, is clearly a move by investors like the pension funds towards alternatives because exactly of that reason. So a part of their portfolio wants to be in alternatives so that they can have higher returns so that their blended returns for their uh, constituents is higher. And so I think what that means is that there is uh, a massive trend towards that around the world and that should benefit, frankly, alternative investors in general like us. Um, so that's clearly a positive. Uh, in terms of us versus others and the fees we charge, uh, you know, obviously our, our fees we think are very much standard compared to our competitors for the types of investments that we offer. And um, like everybody else, I think uh, we try to deliver the best possible returns and at a price or a fee that is very much market. lot more rich families who give away almost all their money, you know, the Buffett, the Gates, the, um, even Zuckerberg uh, already announced it. The Rockefellers these days are selling everything, it goes all in ch into charity. In Italy, the big families, the rich families, they don't, they have a few foundation, but it's, it's very small compared to the U.S. Why is, why is it so different in the U.S. compared to Europe in general? I think that's cultural, and I think that's going to change. Uh, I would say, in general, in the US, I've seen, and this is my personal opinion, but I would say I've seen, generally speaking, amongst the population, not just amongst the super affluent families, but in general, um, clearly, a culture of giving that has been instilled over generations. And so even if you look at the schools, I mean, I'm on one of the boards at Harvard, I'm on one of the boards of my um, alma mater in Italy, Bocconi, and the difference between the amount of giving that is done by you know, US people versus people in Europe is pretty staggering at all level of wealth, not just amongst the ultra high net worth. And I think it's totally cultural, but even within the same school. So I'm the chair of the campaign for my class, for my reunion, for my Harvard Business School reunion. And I have been asked to ask you know, some of my um, colleagues or uh, ex-classmates that are in Europe and some of them in the US. It's much easier to have the conversation with the people in the US than the ones in Europe, simply because in Europe people are not as uh, trained or they don't have the culture to, to give. I don't think it matters. I don't think it's a matter so much of how much you earn. I think it's more a matter of having the culture of giving. I think here it's instilled since you're young 
it's been there for generation and it's more about participation rather than amount it's more about i went to the school the school changed my life i'm going to give even if it's 50 dollars even if it's a hundred dollars i'm just going to give i'm going to give back i think that culture doesn't exist so much in europe i think there's strides that are being made but i think it's going to take probably a generation yeah, there are statistics, I, I think, that say that uh, uh, the Americans are the most generous uh, uh, people in the world in terms of uh, donations to charities and in, uh, in percentage to the income. That's probably true. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I see also the tax uh, way are a very different tax in America and in Italy. No, you can deduct from your tax, your donation in Italy, you can't. I cannot comment on whether in Italy you can't. I don't know if you can or you cannot. If it's not like here, that's possible. I mean, I know that there's ways to make it deductible in Italy as well. I don't think, I think that may be a pro part of the problem. I don't think it's the main crux of the problem, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. Maybe that there's different taxation levels in different places, that's possible, but, uh, but I don't think it's the sole reason. I think the move happens at all levels, really. Uh, but I think, well, I made the move because uh, of various reasons. Because one, uh, and this again, it's very personal, but on a macro level, I think that uh, the businesses of the big banks are becoming more commoditized, while the business of the alternative asset managers are thriving more. And so I think just for that, in that context, it sounded like a smart idea. Uh, frankly, I always wanted to work for KKR. Uh, it was one of my dreams since I was younger. I've always had huge respect for the firm. And so the fact that they asked me to join them made, um, you know, had a huge meaning for me. And, uh, and so it was kind of a no-brainer. Um, I do think that what's great about it is that when you are in a smaller organization that has a lot of power because it has a lot of money to manage and owns a lot of businesses, but is still very nimble because there's only 1,200 employees at KKR versus you know, 30, 40,000 in a place like a Goldman Sachs or a big bank, I think you can act in a way that is much more entrepreneurial. Uh, you can act in a way that is more collaborative because you know everyone and you really can feel that you make a difference within the organization and have much more impact. So I think overall, I'm really happy. Yes, please. We're done. Just a short one. Can you give us your perspective on China and where, <laughs> that you could give us the short version, but give us uh, something. Give, give you something. <laughs> Do you go to China? Do you have clients in China? You know, I was in China about uh, probably two, three months ago. Uh, I think it was extremely interesting. I was in Hong Kong, uh, Beijing, and Shanghai. And I think what is uh, extremely interesting is to continue to see how vibrant uh, the economy is there and uh, how much they're doing in terms of technology and new initiatives. And frankly, the sheer numbers of people, you go to a place like Baidu and you see the headquarters and you, see, you go into the cafeteria and it's as big as a football field and there's thousands and thousands of programmers that are working sort of all day. Um, so it is truly impressive by sort of the magnitude of it all. Um, I think generally speaking our view is that um, you know China has probably bottomed out and is on the rebound and continues to be obviously a tremendous economy to watch uh, because of the sheer size of it and the fact that no matter what happens, the growth rate at which it grows is obviously more significant than most. And so um, definitely somebody that we need to continue to watch. I'm just going to leave it at that. Maybe we have time for another question, if there is. Go ahead. Oh.
What advice do I give to women in the start a new job in a new environment? Any advice? You know, I would say the biggest, the most important characteristics for anyone to succeed are um, one, sort of be resilient because whatever happens in a new job, you're going to find people that you like and love and want to work with and you're going to find somebody that for whatever reason is either going to take credit for what you're doing, is going to do something that, you know, rubs you the wrong way or maybe it's not going to be the most conducive person to work with. I would say don't take it personally, just keep going, do a little bit like the gladiator like I tell my kids and just go in, get there, be your best. And the other thing I would say is, um, you know, be yourself and bring your whole self to work. I know that's a new phrase that is coined and people say, well, is it true that you need to bring your whole self to work? I actually think you do. I think this for the first time is a time and age where after 20 years where women like us had to go to work and pretend that, I mean, I really didn't even put the photograph of my children in my office until I got promoted to, I don't know, managing director because I was afraid that if I put the picture of my kids, people would think I wasn't committed. I mean, that's, it, was, it was that bad for me at least. I'm not saying that anything negative about the place I was working, but that's how I felt. And so I think now we're in a time and an age where it's the perfect moment for women to actually be themselves. Go in, be strong, be yourself, you know, be professional, but don't worry too much about the little things like, am I too vocal, am I not too vocal? Should I say this or should I not say it? Say it, you know, just be out there. Maybe, maybe yes, lean in uh, and, and, and just do your best every day. I think you're gonna do great. Thank you, Monica, great advice.